Being in a leadership position is not the same thing as being a leader. To be a leader, you must be able to connect with, motivate and inspire those you're asking to follow you. My guest today, Brigadier Ian Gardner, led men in a military career which spanned over three decades, including multiple operational tours in Singapore, Oman and Northern Ireland. In this episode, we talk about commanding men during times of war, leadership at the tactical, strategic and executive levels, the books that he has published and showing gratitude for those doing a grand job in a less than grand situation. Welcome to the Stand Easy Podcast, sharing the stories of the men and women of the armed forces, past and present, who have achieved greatness. Your host is Crash Stevenson. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, never did I think in a million years that I would get to sit down with uh, a brigadier in the corps and have a, a conversation. So thanks for joining me. <laughs> Life is not all surprises are unpleasant ones. <laughs> <laughs> My first question is, why the Royal Marines? What inspired you after, over all the other cap badges and services? Why the corps? Well. Yeah, you won't be surprised to hear that <clears throat> no, nobody ever joins the armed forces in peacetime for sensible reasons. <laughs> we all join for superficial reasons. We have no idea what we're letting ourselves in for, have we? No. Aged 16, 17, 18. We're all enthused by tales of daring do and uniforms and all the rest of it. I was no different. Uh, I was in a pipe band and we visited the Scots Guards in Edinburgh and the, we were the, the adjutant and the training officer all dressed up in their immaculate service dress. And we spotty, pubescent teenage boys, we, we signets, <laughs> looked at these geezers. Oh, could we be like that one day? <laughs> anyway, more or less signed up there and then. And my two friends who were with me. Were, they, they did join the army. But at a late stage, I met another guy who'd been a Royal Marine. I'd been at school with him. And he said to me, what the hell do you want to join the army for? All they ever do is back up the Royal Marines. Come and come and join us. Ooh, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> well, yeah. And the rest is history, as they say. <clears throat> and a fancy myself in tight blue trousers, of course. Who doesn't? So for, for young officer training back then, how, how much, I mean, what age did you join that for starters? I was 18. You were 18. Uh, so you didn't go to a, university first? No, never went to university. I'm qualified in nothing. Wow. Actually, that's not true. I'm qualified to ride a motorbike and drive a frigate. Uh, both that's all that matters, useful. really. All that matters. What more do you want? <laughs> were were you treated 18. any differently from your batchmates because you didn't have a degree? I imagine back then the pipeline would have been finish school, yeah. go to university and then join the military. Without that degree, were you looked down on a pole or, or was that sense of brotherhood by the time you got to the end of training very much no. instilled? <clears throat> No, no. Uh, that the, the the degree entry was just beginning to start. Uh, none of my fellow young officers had degrees. Um, one or two core commissions, but the rest of us were in our teens and our twenties. The youngest was seventeen and a half. Wow. Um, and there were a couple of guys who were on the age 21, 22. But we were, none, none of them had degrees. The guys, they just started sending people to university, but they were now at university and would join three years later. So that, that wasn't an issue. And by the way, I don't think it's been an issue ever since, actually. No, no, I don't. I um, I didn't go to uni, primarily because I, uh, I grew up quite, well, single mother. She was glad I didn't go to uni because she didn't have the money for it. Uh, but I remember her saying... Um, you know, week three in training, I think, is a week two. Your family's come down for a weekend and you, you get the weekend off and whatnot. And one of the first things she said to me was, do you know that my food bill has been cut by two thirds since you left? <laughs> I'm like, see, I'm doing my bit. You know, you're saving money. It's great. <clears throat> Imagine what the Royal Marines food bill has gone the other way. <laughs> yeah, especially because we have four meals a day. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so where did you end up serving during your time? Well, <clears throat> first job out of training was in Singapore uh, and Hong Kong in the jungle and significantly on the on the Chinese border with Hong Kong. We did a month there um, in 40 Command. I was a troop commander aged, well, I was aged 19 when I took command of my first troop. I really hadn't a clue what I was doing. Uh, but 
you know, you're surrounded by guys who do know, do, do know what they're doing and they're very patient and kind. Um, it was a very interesting experience on the Chinese border. <laughs> The, the cultural revolution, the great leap forward was leaping forward. And we saw the results of that. And if ever anybody was in any doubt about whether communism was a, was a hellish, evil creed which imprisoned people, then the evidence was there. Although I personally didn't see it, our patrols did watch people being hanged on the other side of the border, people who tried to escape. It was a very interesting time. Mm. And as... You know, I did set to wondering, these young men and women are charging around China, waving little red books, screaming rubbish. What if I'd been born Chinese? They're the same age as me. Would I be doing that? And that sets you thinking. What if I'd been 18 and born in West Belfast? Would I have joined the IRA? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Uh, so I came to the conclusion that so much depends on where you were born and how you were brought up, that your belief sets are so much dictated by that. And it was a very interesting lesson for life. And when I've met other people whose views differ entirely from mine, I've always borne that in mind. Mm. Mm. So my first job was Hong Kong, and then I came back and finished training. And then uh, Northern Ireland, I had two tours in Northern Ireland in the early 70s. Uh, it was like the Wild West then. I hated the first one. Um, Bright-eyed, bushy-tailed thinking we're going to go and help <clears throat> we idealistic young officers went out there and discovered we were part of the problem. We were supporting a corrupt, incompetent, biased police force. And we were the instruments of a British government which had failed to address the civil rights of the Roman Catholics in Northern Ireland for the previous 50 years. And it wasn't pleasant. And I didn't feel I had anyone to turn to. And I very nearly left the Royal Marines on the strength of that. The mm -hmm. second tour wasn't much better, which was rapid succession operation Motorman. Um, but anyhow, we got over that. <clears throat> I trained recruits at Limpston for a while. And then I volunteered to go. I did, I did SBS training shortly as well. I, I passed all that except the diving. They told me to come back in a year's time. They thought I was rather immature, which I would say was probably a, an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, by then I'd, I'd applied to go to Oman and I was accepted and I was taught Arabic, 10 week crash course. I was sent to Oman and uh, found myself second in command of a, a rifle company of Omani and Baluch soldiers there in a guerrilla war, the Dofar War, mm. uh, and discovered a really super, super bunch of guys. My boss was a magic guy. He was a contract officer, a mercenary. And uh, I was good at things he wasn't good at. He was good at things I wasn't good at. It was, we, were, we were a great pair. And uh, we worked very successfully and happily uh, commanding this company against communist guerrillas in the Jibble. He was killed eventually, and I took over from him. But, you know, uh, Oman has really defined my life ever since. I, I learned my craft there. I learned how important artillery is. I learned how important machine gun fire is. I learned how important it is that you you have to train the, the lowest paid people in the organization to take decisions because you simply can't do it all yourself. And I'm sure the lessons that I and lots of other Royal Marines who were there learnt in that place, those lessons suffused into the core and the casualty rate, the low casualty rate at the core endured or didn't endure in the Falklands War eight years later, I have no doubt reflected the operational ethos that had been taught to the Royal Marines officers in Oman. Uh, Falklands War, Commander X-ray Company 4-5 Commando. Um, yeah, uh, hardly need to say more than that, brilliant. Commando, brilliant. I mean, the whole leadership thing from top to bottom was superb. We knew we were in good hands. We knew we were going to win, provided the Navy got us ashore, didn't lose so many ships that they couldn't sustain us. Get the Royal Marines ashore, put them alongside the parachute regiment, send them up a hill in the night amongst the rocks in a snowstorm in the mist. You know what? We're not going to come second. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not a chance. No chance, Jimmy. <laughs> no, we were going to win. The question was what the cost would be and how long it would take. And mm. cost 
fought. I mean, every single man lost was a tragedy, of course. But I, not a day passes without a humble, grateful thought that I came home personally with the same number of live Marines that I took, even though we had a major attack against a well-entrenched enemy at night up a thousand foot mountain. Um, and how, how good is that? There were lots of reasons for that, which we can explore, but uh, luck was one of the top reasons. But anyhow, Falklands War, and thereafter, staff officer around the bazaars until I commanded 40 Commando, which was an absolute joy. Uh, I was told before I commanded the unit that you would have your good days, you would have your bad days. Remember when the, good, when the bad days happen, they're probably going to get even worse before they get good again. <laughs> <clears throat> I think that's pretty standard, that, isn't it? Well, I'd been in command for about two months when I remembered this conversation. I suddenly realised, you know what? That general had told me that he was talking complete cock. <laughs> I came out two years later on the same high that I'd gone in two years before. Why? Because I had a brilliant bunch of officers and senior NCOs uh, who just were up for anything, who knew their jobs and who enjoyed their jobs. My job was to make sure they enjoyed their jobs and wanted to give them their best. But we were, uh, I feel, uh, I was just so blessed with superb officers. Many of them went on to high rank, three commandant generals to date, um, from my, my subalterns um, <clears throat> and my, my company commanders, a string of brigadiers and other major generals. Um, they have no idea how proud of my babies I am. <laughs> yeah. I, didn't, I, didn't I didn't teach them very much, but at least I didn't screw them up. So that was 40 commander. And then my final appointment was in, uh, in Brussels. My fourth war, if you will, uh, sitting on my fat backside in an armchair in Brussels. I never went to the Balkans, but for three years, I was deeply involved in the Kosovo conflict. I was secretary to the military committee. In other words, I was the, the, the functionary which kept the military committee, the top military body in NATO, administratively on the road. I was the liaison between the secretary general and the chairman of the military committee. So the Kosovo crisis and its management, the strategic and political management of it was every day on my desk. Um, absolutely fascinating. Um, put me off politics for life, <clears throat> uh, but uh, it was an extremely interesting and useful job. So that was, there you are, 33 years in a nutshell, a 33 year gap here between leaving school and working, um, more or less. <laughs> Some hellish, hellish moments. Made a lot of friends, lost a few. Uh, what's history being made? Gave it a, an anonymous nudge every now and then. How lucky am I? <laughs> Pretty lucky, I'd say. That's some career. <laughs> There's something I'm curious of. Um, so I read a book called Call Sign Chaos by um, former USMC Commandant General uh, James Mattis. Oh, yeah. And the, the book centers around the three different leaderships, so tactical, strategic, and executive. So I'm wondering, did you notice from being a troop commander to company commander to being a brigadier, did you notice any difference in the way you had to lead men or were you very much say the same frame of mind that we give our the lowest rank that opportunity to think for themselves and that carries on? It's a very interesting question, isn't it? <clears throat> and I'm not sure I've got the real answer, but I can, I'm, what I'm completely confident about at whatever level you are leading. Um, generals can make plans, but unless the lowest paid people in the organization are willing to implement those plans wholeheartedly, the plans aren't worth the paper they're written on. Um, <clears throat> of course, there are lots of other levels in between who have to be motivated too. But we're all the same. We're all human beings. We're all the same animal. We respond to the same stimuli. And trust, trust is the glue which holds together all human relationships. And absence of trust means, well, the thing's not going to work. Now, just look at the Russians now. 
the whole culture is not based on trust, it's based on fear. I saw the Argentine army at close quarters. There was an army, the glue which didn't hold that army together was fear. Um, trust was simply absent. Was it the, and, uh, with the Argentinians, was it the fear of failing and then going back to Argentina? No, <clears throat> it was, uh, well, I ended up guarding about 300 of them at the end, including their officers and their NCOs. They couldn't believe that I was an officer. I dressed the same as my Marines. I ate the same as my Marines. I looked the same. I looked shitty, dirty, knackered. Uh, and you know, there was no obvious difference. Okay, I wore three pips tucked away there underneath my rucksack, but they, they couldn't believe that. And when they couldn't, when they eventually were persuaded, yes, I am the company commander, they couldn't understand how anybody in the company from the most junior Marine to the Sergeant Major could approach me with no appointment, address me, perhaps call me sir, but the conversation would be a civilized, agreeable conversation with lots of please and thank you. And my instructions given with please and thank you would be instantly and completely obeyed. They couldn't, they didn't get this. They, their style, they couldn't get that I was there for them, not mm. the other way around. And I think that was the greatest single thing which separated us from the Argentine army, this style of leadership. The NCOs were bullies and were very, very sore on the men. Physical violence was not at all uncommon. Um, the officers were self-serving, arrogant shits and had no sense of care or responsibility for the well-being and the happiness and the, the efficiency of their people. And they deserved what they got. The soldiers, the, the soldiers were like soldiers everywhere, young men everywhere. No, we actually felt sorry for them. You know, under other circumstances, we could have become friends. But uh, <clears throat> it was a very interesting illustration to me of how, how not to be a leader. Now, up at the, the strategic levels, yeah, probably some other considerations come into play. I've no doubt they do. But still, you're dealing with people. You're dealing with people. And quality, quality is a gift from your people to you. You cannot extract or extort that quality. You have to win that gift. And you win it by trust and by you giving as much as you taking. Uh, and that, 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 I think, is at the very heart of leadership. There's more bullshit <laughs> talked about leadership than you can shake a stick at. But at the very heart of it is, I think, is that, that attitude at whatever level. Mm. So my... My favourite CEO um, was, was fairly recently, so the, I was down at a Command Logistic Regiment prior to coming to where I am now. And the CEO when I got down there was Lieutenant Colonel Rob Jones, and he was known vicariously as being a people person. Yeah. So when he came round, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was part of Med Squadron, when he came round the squadron lines, you know, it was immaculate, don't get me wrong. But he didn't care about stuff like that. He cared, yes, you know, keep your work lines tidy, make sure that, you know, faults are reported, all this sort of stuff. But what he cared about and what he was so good at was coming around and speaking to everyone. Yep. And on the off chance that it was CO's rounds and he uh, of, of the of the Marines accommodation and he could make it with the with the RSM. Very rarely did he actually look inside the guy's rooms. He was just walking up and having a chat with them. Oh, so how long have you been here? Are you enjoying it? Do you know what you want to do in the Corps? Are you going away soon? And that for me was, you know, personally, someone of that rank showing interest in me and what I want to do and everything else. That inspired me to go and do the very best that I could because we, you know, we're not mates. But I'm like, he, he genuinely does have an interest in us. So I want to do my best for him. Really great well, CEO. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, when I was CEO, I had a slush fund. It wasn't big, but, uh, <clears throat> but it was a CEO's fund. And my discretion over how I spent this money was entirely up to me within certain bounds. Of course, I couldn't entertain all my pals down CEO's house. But <laughs> <laughs> what I did with it, I told my company commanders, I want one name from each of you every week. I want you to name for me somebody who's doing 
an unspectacular post, but doing a good job, either cleaning the lavvies or mending engines or running the library or a cleaner here, a driver there, a sentry over there. Who is it? Just name for me and tell me where she or he works, civilian or military. And when I did my rounds on Friday, I would go and seek this person out from underneath the stairs or wherever they were and say, hello, thank you. I just want you to know how much I value the job you're doing. If you weren't doing whatever, cleaning the lavies, we'd all be in shit. If you weren't looking after these books or these stores, we'd be in a total mess. And I want you to know that I know that and I'm grateful to you for that. And here's a check for 50 quid. Nice. And very rarely in my life <clears throat> has it fallen to me to be able to sprinkle stardust over people at no cost to myself and be a fairy mm. godmother. <laughs> yeah. But I think that was important. And I'm deeply conscious. I think my life's experience has taught me that my reputation and my life rests upon the shoulders of teenage boys. And some of those boys were very teenaged indeed. In Oman, there were no birth certificates in Oman. I had no idea what age my soldiers were, but I could show you pictures of some of them. These guys aren't yet 15, maybe even 14. Um, and I, you know, they, 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 they had to know what to do when we were ambushed. They had to know what to do on sentry without me telling them what to do. I mean, they had to do that. And I had to train them to do that. And I had to explain to them and teach them. Otherwise, we were all dead. Mm. So uh, uh, the battle for two sisters. I didn't win the battle for two sisters. I was part of a large piece of machinery which got <clears throat> 150 Marines, my 150 Marines, to the right place. Not quite at the right time. Approximately the right time. A bit late, but nevertheless, we got them there. Mentally, physically, intellectually, spiritually prepared to get in there and kill the Queen's enemies in a most efficient and quick way. But then it was up to them. I, I couldn't see more than five metres in front of me in the snowstorm and the mist and the black night. And my night vision had been blown away by every piece of star shell you can imagine and that. A noise so loud that you, 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 you thought your eardrums were going to meet in the middle of your head. They had to do it themselves. They had to do it. And uh, my job was to get them to that point where they did it extremely well. Mm. But they did it. And if they couldn't do it, we were bunkerooed. But they did it, of course. Did they ever? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So 33 years minus one year for a gap year. You leave the well, corps. That, that was the gap year, 33 year gap year. <laughs> oh. So you leave the corps. Yeah. Um, what is what is the, the natural progression for a brigadier leaving the corps? What sort of job do you walk into? Well, you don't walk into any job. <clears throat> you're suddenly on the civic job market and you've got to hunt your meat, hunt your own meat. You become another unemployed man in your 50s. In my case, I was 51, looking for a job. There's no walking into any job, at least I didn't find. So I had to search the newspapers. Uh, the internet wasn't the place you look for jobs then. All the contacts I had, <clears throat> uh, big decisions you had to take. Where are you going to live? I mean, what's your priority? Are you going to seek a job and then go and live there? Or are you going to live somewhere and then seek a job? We chose the latter. We decided to live in Edinburgh. Uh, I got a super job running a big charity here in Scotland, the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, mm. animal, animal welfare charity. It was actually well paid. It was a chief executive's job. I was employing, I personally was employing 240 people all over Scotland. It had a, an international dimension to it as well. And it was service. I mean, we, we in the services, we in the Royal Marines in particular, we serve. Mm. Uh, I've often been asked what the link was between being a trained killer in the Royal Marines and being an animal welfare guy. Well, the answer is one word, it's service. Mm. We're here to serve the community. And in a strange way, I felt that here was, well, not in a strange way, I think a perfectly rational way. What is a civilized community? I think it's one which takes some account of the, the sick, the poor, 
Um, I'm not a raving socialist, but unless unless you look after people in your society who are less able to look after themselves, children, uh, the weak, the women, or whatever, then you're not a civilized society. I think and that includes animals too. The way you treat your animals says a lot about you as a civilized society, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt that I was playing my bit in running this organization. It was a great organization. I did it for a number of years. But my wife and I decided to reinvent ourselves. She wanted to go back to the law. <clears throat> I wanted to be self-employed. So I started writing books and being a house husband, looking after two teenage children, which frankly didn't need much looking after because they were so competent themselves. But it left me free to write books and to build up my own little portfolio of part-time jobs and be the master of my own diary, which that was actually very successful in the end. I also lived and was I was a parent on the ground with parent ready for their first with, with two teenage children, which was a super experience for me, getting to know them at a really very formative period in their lives. And the relationship I have with them, of course, now happily reflects that. Mm. So with your, your, you have three books, correct? Yes, indeed. Yeah. So what was, did you, had you done any research about writing prior to going into it? Or was it just, I'm going to write a book and I'm just going to figure out how to do it. I'm going to write it and then I'll seek a publisher. Did, did you have any sort of background in it already? No, <clears throat> but I mean, we all have, has, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. <clears throat> uh, don't ask me to add up. But when it comes to talking and writing, I can do that. It became clear to me when I was building up my portfolio of videos that I had a story to tell. There was a story to be told about the Dofar War in Oman. It was a very little understood war, not at all widely known. It was at the same time as the Vietnam War, of course, and all the world's press was hoovered up by Vietnam. And yet here was a war which was of greater strategic significance in the Vietnam War. No one's ever heard of it, but you'd have heard about it if we'd lost it, for sure. Mm. It was a war for the Strait of Hormuz, i.e. Mm. the world's oil coming out of the Gulf. And nothing, or very little, had been written about it. I thought I knew quite a lot about it. So I sat down and researched a lot. I got in touch with a lot of my friends who were there with me. And I, I wrote the book and lots and lots of people read drafts and did a lie detector test on it. And, uh, and then I started looking for a publisher. I started looking for an agent to begin with. And, uh, no agent, <clears throat> agents, yeah, they want volume agents. And my book was never going to be volume and that, that would make an agent money. So I found myself a publisher who'd been great and they published it. It's been very successful. It's been translated into Arabic. It's been uh, it's been on sale in the Middle East, and it has actually, within the lights of a book of that nature, been extremely successful. I'm told that it's uh, required reading for young officers joining the Royal Marines, <laughs> together oh, wow. with my other book, together with my other book on Royal Marines matters, that the, the Yompers, which was written with the same spirit in mind. Um, I published uh, two of well, the, the the Oman book, and I did one on First World War aviation as well. That's another story. The Yompers, the, the, the Falklands book, again, it seemed to me a lot of misunderstandings and uh, gaps in the, the public knowledge. And uh, I also felt that, you know, unless you write things down, you weren't there. They didn't happen. Mm. History is only that which has been recorded, that which has been written. Um, my wife is a medieval historian at the moment, and she's working on letters which were written 600 years ago. If those letters had not been written or had not survived, there would be no history. Mm. Well, I was going to record <clears throat> what the, 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 basically the history of 4-5 Commando and the Falklands War uh, from the point of view of one of the company commanders. And again, I consulted <clears throat> as many people as I could get hold of, which was great because I got in touch with people with whom I otherwise would have lost touch. And they were kind enough to tell me where I was wrong, uh, tell me some of their stories and do a lie detector test, de-enrich the potential insults. <laughs> 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 and that book too has been well received. Uh, I love the late great professor Eric Groves remark this is the one of, the, one of the finest books by a serving officer ever written. My goodness me, what, what, 
what, what more could you ask? <laughs> so they've been confident. successful. They've been successful. It's been a great satisfaction to me. They're never going to make any money much, but the yeah, the story has now been told. History has been recorded. Mm. Uh, and the other book, <clears throat> well, some 50 odd years ago, I met a, a pilot, a, a, an old man. He'd been a pilot in the First World War. He was oh, old and wise. I was young and stupid. Wasn't a lot of communication between us. But his daughter gave me a dozen pages he'd written about a raid he'd taken part in on a Zeppelin shed deep into Germany in November 1914. Where has this been in history? Well, and then I started looking at there were other raids which took part. The Royal Naval Air Service was doing stuff, bombing, flying at night, using radios. We all think of the, the Royal Flying Corps dropping bombs out of cockpits in the trenches. I, the, the Navy was doing some far more serious stuff, led by the Royal Marines. The first ever strategic bomber pilot in history was a Royal Marine. <laughs> Put that in your core history lessons at Lipston. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Anyhow, so, that's a... Sorry, go on. You know, I, I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, no, not at all. That's exactly why I brought you on. No, it's great. <laughs> um, you're a motivational speaker as well. Well, I don't call myself a motivational speaker. Um, I believe my experience has given me some insights into how leaders, how organizations might help or try to manage in fast moving, dynamic, chaotic situations. Um, <clears throat> it's called Mission Command. The title of my core lecture is Succeeding in Chaos. Um, and at the very heart of it, you won't be surprised to hear is this doctrine of the leader setting a course, setting a, a, a mission, uh, setting a, a, a thinking behind the mission, the overarching purpose to the mission, uh, delegating tasks to individuals that uh, fit that mission and help to succeed that, help that mission to succeed, but then letting the people on the ground take decisions according to the fast moving fluid circumstances they find in front of them. And not constantly sitting on their asses waiting for the boss to tell them what to do. Mm. Like what the Russians, <clears throat> I mean, nothing could be a more a stark example, no more stark example could be than the Russian campaign invading Ukraine, certainly at the beginning, um, and just being knocked sideways, not backwards, because uh, people couldn't respond to fast moving situations on the ground because they were frightened to take any decisions. Um, and the Ukrainians were doing, of course, exactly the opposite. And they were knocking the Russians right back. And I think that that, that, that a very stark example of how not to do it. <clears throat> I've seen it done both ways. And uh, fortunately, my own experience, my own masters had taught me how to do it the way that I just described, but I'd seen it done the other way and I'd seen it fail on exercise. And so that is the heart of my, my so-called motivational speaking, but it's not motivational at all. It's just, hey boys, <clears throat> you, you've got to trust your people. You've got to train your people. You've got to equip your people to take decisions. A lot of moral mm -hmm. courage required. It's not easy. It's not for control freaks. It's not for people who won't take decisions, who won't take risks, but, uh, and, and, and you know, there are three and only three types of military operations, AMFUs, SAMFUs, and KUMFUs. Adjustable military foul-ups, semi-adjustable military foul-ups, and complete military foul-ups. <laughs> um, and if you don't accept that, if you don't accept that things are going to change, that plans are not going to survive first contact, uh, then you, you're not going to survive at all. <clears throat> but if your people can respond if, if your plan is even 10% less chaotic or 90% less chaotic than the other side, then your side will win. But the other side's plan, of course, are not surviving contact with you. So it, it, it's this struggle between the relative sizes of your chaos, if you will. <laughs> mm. I think Russia on 
on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I think two two points really stuck out to me after, well, three actually. When I first heard that Russia invaded, my first thought were, oh shit, um, because you know, with, with everyone, regardless of any briefs that you receive and and all this sort of stuff, you think if Russia's getting involved in something, World War Three isn't far away. Now, thankfully, we're we're nowhere near that. However, the <clears> second <throat> point was shortly after the Russians invaded. There's a website called Funker 350, and they they post unbiased videos from basically wherever they can get it in the war zone. So there's there's videos of Russians with GoPros, with Ukrainians with GoPros, etc. But the two things that really got to me were one, Russia clearly expected the Ukrainians to up sticks and run away so they could just roll on in and take over. And it was quite the opposite. The Ukrainians fought like some of the greatest warriors since the legions of Rome. And they were yeah. not rolling over and, and showing their bellies to anyone. So that put Russia immediately on the back foot, I think. And also the fact that Russia's logistical supply chain is absolute garbage. Um, there was videos showing um, Russians going into corner shops in Ukraine because they ran out of rations. They were siphoning fuel tanks for their um, for their APCs and for their tanks because they couldn't get the fuel sent forward to them. Probably in small part due to the fact that they thought the campaign wouldn't take as long. But as you said, you know, and as 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 the military has taught every single person that joins, a plan never supply, survives past its first contact. Yeah. And so the initial invasion didn't go very well. It probably could have went better if their logistical supply chain was up to par. Well, <clears throat> one of the greatest crimes a soldier at any level can commit is to underestimate their enemy. And the Russians did that in spades. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and we're pretty good at that in this country historically, but at least we didn't do that in the Falklands. Um, we didn't do that in Oman. Um, yeah. And the other great crime is to start a war and then lose it. <laughs> well, this is the other thing. So, uh, you know, that I had um, Emil guessing on uh, what night would that have been? Tuesday night. Um, and I asked him, so he went out to Ukraine during the annexation of Crimea back in 2014. And uh, I asked him, you know, with, with what's going on just now, is there a is there a good end to this war? Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, Obviously, there is no good end to a war. Um, he thought that eventually Russia would be forced to go into negotiations. Um, but he said that the Ukrainians, they don't hate Russia. They hate the Kremlin. Yeah. And that that got to me. It's like, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a really fair point. Yeah. But I think, personally, Putin is now in a position where he's committed so much that he can't withdraw and look like he's losing face on the political stage in the world. This has got to be probably his last stand politically to to ensure that he gets everything that he can from this war. Yeah, I think all that's true. I think think long, think the stasis of the First World War. Don't think that an Ukrainian offensive this so-called spring is going to suddenly break through. It's not. Um, it's not going to change anything. It's going to be like First World War offensives, a bit of this, a bit of that. But the side that eventually wins in many wars is the side that's most motivated, i.e. the side that's willing to take the most sacrifices, the side that's got the most to lose. And that's not Russia. Uh, and I don't think... Putin's position <clears throat> is fragile, but daily, as day and day goes by, it gets more and more brittle. Mm-hmm. Trust is completely absent in the Russian hierarchy. He's being supported by his henchmen because at the moment they feel there's nowhere else to, there's no one else to support, and there's a possibility of getting the outcome they want. But <clears throat> when that changes, and it It will change, I think, when the people, particularly the mothers of Russia, do what they did with Afghanistan and finally revolt against the useless, pointless deaths of so many young men um, that it is no longer sustainable. Mm. And then things could happen very quickly. I don't think they may happen soon, 
But when it does happen, be, don't be surprised if it all happens rather quickly. Um, yeah, I've got, I'm no great insight, but Putin's, Putin's position is not getting any stronger. No. I don't think. <clears throat> One of the things that I also got from uh, General Matz's book, he was an avid reader of military history and he used um, he used military tactics that were used hundreds of years ago during Iraq and they still work just as well because in reality warfare doesn't change. <laughs> when it's boots on the ground, it doesn't change. We're now moving into uh, a, a very technologically advanced warfare where we have drones, um, you know, a lot of psyops, cyber attacks, all this sort of stuff. But the actual boots on the ground, the very mechanics of it, don't change greatly over the course of history. I think that's right. <clears throat> uh, I think you. I can't really improve what you've just said, but. Uh, it's people. It's all about people, people on the ground. And um, yes, technology, of course, has changed the way war has been fought over the years. But uh, ultimately, the sort of specialization you and I have, uh, what I call the specialization of the last 500 meters, um, where ultimately, men and it's predominantly men i'm afraid it will <clears throat> always i'm afraid it always will be men unless you would start breeding a a bunch of uh, very very special women i mean women I mean, don't get me wrong i i i've got the greatest respect for female warriors but there's such a war is such a physical like infantry soldier is such a physical thing there are plenty of women who can do it of course but the predominantly it will be conducted by men um well, the rubber meets the road, men still have to fight with clubs and pointed sticks. Mm. My Marines went in with a bayonet on the two sisters and dispatched the Queen's enemies. I believe it happened in Afghanistan as well. And unless you are training people to do that, if necessary, the other side's going to do it and you're going to lose. Mm. Um, Absolutely. I think there's some eternal truths about war, which, I mean, first, that every war in history has lasted longer than the people who started it thought it would. Uh, how often have we heard that it will be over by Christmas? Um, unless you are in it for a long, sometimes very long term, but don't even think of starting a war of choice. The Russians got that wrong. The Argentines, even though the war only lasted 74 days, or 73 days longer than the Argentines thought it would. Yeah. Uh, secondly, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Well, that's but we've all discussed that. Um, thirdly, I think in every war in history, sooner or later, you end up sitting down and talking with and living with your enemies. Um, and it's well to remember that as you're fighting war, because the way you behave during the war will shape your peace. Mm. I mean, for instance, Oman is at peace now. Members of the who were on the enemy side are now part of the government. Uh, reconciliation was eventually achieved. Northern Ireland, well, you can discuss whether Northern Ireland's at peace, but it's relative peace when you look at Northern Ireland's history, because we didn't go and search out the killers in the south and slot them extrajudiciously. We tried to abide by the law. We tried to behave in a civilized manner to a very large degree. And that, I think, reflects the sort of peace you've got there. Fourthly, if you don't understand and take account of your enemy's nightmares, he's going to surprise you. Russia has nightmares like of which you and I have no conception. They're invaded by the Mongols, the Poles, the Lithuanians, the Germans, the French, the Swedes, the Japs. Even the Brits have invaded Russia. Um, they, don't, they, they lost one-sixth of their population during the war. We lost one-sixtieth. The Americans mm. lost one 250th, 95% uh, of all Allied casualties in the Second World War were Russian. Wow. Try and tell an American that, they won't believe you. That's why they just don't understand Russia. I'm not saying that excuses what Russia is doing now, but it helps to explain mm. why Putin is able to play a tune that resonates with Russians. Mm. Um, what else have we got? It's a clash of wills, I said, you know, the side that 
you know, the most motivated. Um, deterrence, if the enemy doesn't believe that you're willing and able to fight, then you probably will have to fight like the Falklands, the Argentines. Not for a second would they have invaded if they believed we'd do something about it. Yeah. Uh, that was a British failure, a failure of deterrence. And by the way, don't try and take democracy willy-nilly around the world. It's a very particular fragile flower. It depends upon uh, the minority in a country believing in the ultimate benevolence of the majority. And there are very few places where that applies. Um, it sort of applies here. It sort of applies in America, but less so day by day. Um, but don't try and take it to places where the minority feels that if you give the majority power, they're going to hammer us into the deck. It doesn't work. Mm. Anyhow, that's enough from me. <laughs> Homespun philosophy. <laughs> There's only one other question I'd like to ask you about your career. Um, and it's only through reading on your website that I came across this. And I'm curious as to how you ended up. You're a host on the Flying Scotsman train. Is that still correct? Uh, <clears throat> the Flying Scotsman is a big steam engine, big green steam engine, which lives in a shed in York. The Royal Scotsman is a very ah. swanky train of... Uh, eight or nine, maybe 10 coaches, which goes around Scotland and takes people to castles and gardens. It, uh, they feed them world-class wines and, 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 and uh, food. And I <clears throat> take them to visit castles and gardens and do clay pigeon shooting, etc., with them. And it's great fun. Uh, I do about six journeys a year. I meet people from all over the world. I love doing it for all sorts of reasons, but chiefly because the people I'm doing it with, I'm the old git on the crew. I do guest speak. All the rest of the crew are in their 20s, 30s, I think the oldest might be 40. Um, and these bright, sparky, professional young men and women from all over the world, it's lovely working with them. It's a bit like being back in the core again, mm. having so many sparky, bright, uh, committed, professional, goal-orientated people. I mean, part of the team is, for, for me, great fun. But I, I, I <clears throat> I'm the one who interfaces most with the guests because they're mostly my age. Um, and so that's the part I play. <laughs> it's, well, not, not for, it's not for sissies, mind you. <laughs> hey, how does <laughs> one get into that? Into that well, the job was advertised. Or... job was advertised. And, uh, as easy as that. It's just we're, we're seeking a speaker and you've applied. Well, uh, no, not so much a speaker. We're, we're seeking a host and here are the requirements. Uh, are you up for it? And I applied and I got it. Um, so yeah, but it's not for sissies. Things go wrong. Engines mm. break down. Kitchens burst into flames. Um, you, know, you get some people who are pathologically unpleasable, <laughs> and then you get Russians who simply can't tell the time. They're, they're, they're always half an hour late for everything, and so they're at all. Uh, <laughs> my so I, I have first-hand experience of this. So my my uh, wife is half Peruvian. Um, oh, and wonderful. So we we will hear stories from from back in Peru. So my mother in law has lived in the UK since I forget, probably coming on 43, 44 years now. But she WhatsApps and uh, has link ups with the family back in Peru, and she'll say, you know, five o'clock UK time is well four hours behind. Um, so one o'clock Peru time, and she's sitting there twiddling her thumbs, looking at her watch, and she's like, you know, they'll, they'll get here eventually. Fashionably late is an understatement for, for Peruvians, but it's very much just a cultural thing with them. It's not even seen as rude. It's just for me, and I guess for you and, and anyone else who might be anally retentive when it comes to uh, timings due to having served, if I'm not there somewhere five minutes before, yep. I start to get sweaty palms. And this isn't even necessarily a, something to do with work being in the military. It could just be, you know, going to pick my daughter up from a class or taking my son somewhere I'm sitting there you know my feet are going my palms are sweating I'm like come on get a move on and it's just <laughs> one of those things whereas Peru is just such a laid-back atmosphere I, I could not well, I mean, we've not visited yet but I just I, I don't think I would get on there I'd be too highly strung <laughs> maybe if they well, plow me some of their pisco sours it would be okay yeah yeah 
Well, on my train, of course, the extra dimension is that if you're not there on time, the train's gone. <laughs> well, yeah, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> and they usually learn their lesson after day one. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're getting close to wrapping up now. There's one question that I ask every mom, every guest that I have, and that's what did it mean to you to serve in the military? Uh, what was it Samuel Johnson? said that uh, every man thinks mainly of himself for not having been a soldier or for not having gone to sea. Uh, and you know what? I can see what he means. <laughs> hmm. uh, I am, yeah, there were other things I could have done, I guess. I got into the Royal Marines by whim and I nearly left on several occasions. Um, I am extremely lucky that I'm in one piece, mentally and physically. Mm. Uh, I'm, I think that the, the light motif of my life today is one of gratitude, humility and gratitude at how lucky I have been in so many different ways. Uh, and I'm really glad that I did what I did. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's one of deep, profound, lifelong gratitude. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Well, the only thing left for me to do is say, Brigadier Ian Gardner, thank you very much indeed for joining me. And uh, I look forward to maybe catching up again soon. Thank you very much indeed. It was great fun. <laughs>